This video was produced for Newcastle Disability Forum's No Steps History Walks project, funded by the People's Health Trust, using money raised by the Health Lottery, Northeastern Cumbria. The North East has had more than its fair share of inventors down the years. Most people know about a few of them, and they deserve their fame. But in this video, I'll also talk about some of the lesser-known innovators, people like John Bird and Gladstone Adams. Who are they? Well, keep listening and you'll find out. Let there be light, a fine sentiment but easier said than done, which brings us to one of the great geniuses of Victorian England, Joseph Swan. Born in Bishop Wearmouth in 1828, Swan left school at 12 and became an apprentice chemist with the firm of John Mawson. At the time, the only sources of light were gas, which was dangerous, and the newly developed electric arc, which was almost as bad. Many people were working on an incandescent light bulb using a thin filament heated by an electric current. The problem was that if you heated a filament, it burned away. Finding the right material and then sealing it off from the air was a tricky proposition. In 1860, Swan thought he'd cracked it using fine paper coated with carbon, but when he put a current through it, it merely glowed red hot. He needed white heat and felt he'd run out of ideas as to how to get it. So for the next few years, Swan switched to the new medium of photography. But by the 1870s, new technology meant a glass bulb could have almost all of the air pumped out. So, on December the 18th, 1878, Joseph Swan demonstrated a new incandescent light bulb to the Newcastle Chemical Society. It consisted of a cotton fibre coated with carbon and placed inside an evacuated glass cylinder. By October 1880, he'd improved his design and showed it to the lit and fill. He asked for 70 gas jets to be turned down and illuminated the building with just 20 of his new bulbs. In America, a certain Thomas Edison had independently hit on the same idea, but Swan patented his bulb a year before. There was a legal battle, then the inventors agreed to cooperate and created the Ediswan Company. But Swan was not a businessman, and two years later he sold out to Edison and went back to photography. It was left to the aggressive and often dishonest Thomas Edison to claim the credit he was only partly entitled to. Let's journey back further in time for our next pioneers and look at the region's long seafaring tradition. Our first inventor came up with a simple idea, but one that saved innumerable lives on all the seven seas. In 1789, the ship Adventure ran aground on a sandbank during a storm. Despite being close to land, the bad weather meant that the crew and passengers could not be rescued. People on shore watched helplessly as men fell from the rigging into the sea. The tragedy led to the formation of a northeast committee to look into the construction of a rescue boat. Two designs were submitted. One, by William Woodhave of South Shields, was a revolutionary boat made of copper with cork for buoyancy. In theory, unsinkable, but the committee felt it was too revolutionary for practical purposes. The other design, by Henry Greathead, was a more conventional wooden boat that would always float upright if turned over. Greathead was commissioned to build a self-writing boat to demonstrate the feasibility of his idea. Eventually, he was to construct 31 lifeboats. Apart from Woodhave, there's a rival claim to the invention of the lifeboat by Lionel Lukin, who had converted a northeast Cobol some years earlier. But Greathead was recognised by Parliament as the creator of the Purpose Built, lifeboat. His original boat carried out her first rescue in 1790. On the 30th of January, she rescued the crew of a vessel aground on Heard Sands. A few years before Greathead's lifeboat, a man called John Bird had made a name for himself with the Navy and one of the great explorers, Captain James Cook. Born in Bishop Auckland, Bird specialised in making navigational instruments, vital to all ships' captains. In those days, navigation was by the sun, moon and stars, 
and very practical devices were needed to take readings from the deck of a ship at sea. Bird created sextants, oxtants and quadrants, along with barometers, thermometers and telescopes. One of his great innovations was to use brass instead of iron, as was traditional. Iron tended to expand and contract with temperature, making readings uncertain. Brass didn't. Captain Cook took one of Bird's sextants with him in 1768 on his first voyage. Between them, it's fair to say, John Bird and Henry Greathead must have saved thousands of seafarers' lives. Good for them. Saving lives was also on the mind of a commercial photographer called Gladstone Adams in 1908. He was driving home from London to Whitley Bay, having seen Newcastle lose to Wolves in the FA Cup final at Crystal Palace. That was on April the 25th. But to add to his misery, the weather was very wintry. Rain and snow battered his French Darak automobile. At the time, windscreens were cleaned by stopping, getting out, and wiping with a cloth, or possibly your motoring cap. Adams had a eureka moment when he realised that a simple mechanical blade could move back and forth over the glass. He patented the idea in 1911, and his prototype is on display at the Discovery Museum. Adams went on to be a photographic officer in the Royal Flying Corps during the First World War. One of his incidental duties was to arrange the funeral of Manfred von Richthofen, the Red Baron, shot down over the British front line in 1917. In World War II, Adams was too old to join up, but he helped run the local air training corps. He also instituted an award, the Gladstone Adams Cup, which is still given to top local air cadets. By this point, you might be wondering why I've not mentioned the greatest Geordie inventor of all, George Stevenson. Wonder no more. George Stevenson was indeed a great inventor, but it's worth noting that his son Robert was an even more accomplished engineer, and much of the fame that accrued to the bluff working-class George was really down to Robert. They were a remarkable father and son combination. George Stevenson was born in Wylam in 1781. His parents, Robert and Mabel, couldn't read or write. Robert worked as a fireman on the pumping engine at Wylam Colliery, on a low wage that meant they couldn't afford to school their children. At the age of 17, George became an engine man at New Bern's Water Row Pit, and he spent his nights teaching himself how to read and write. In 1802, George married Frances Henderson, and the young couple moved to Willington Quay. George got a job as a brakesman, and mended clocks in his spare time to make more money. Their first child, Robert, was born in 1803. Their second, named after Frances, was born two years later, but she only lived three weeks. Frances Stevenson herself died in 1806 of consumption, or tuberculosis, as we call it today. In 1811, the pumping engine at High Pit in Killingworth broke down, and George offered to improve it. He proved such an excellent mechanic that he was promoted to engine man, overseeing all the pumping engines in the area. This was a vital job, as without steam power to pump out water, coal mines soon flooded. In 1815, George Stevenson produced his safety lamp, designed to minimise the risk of explosions caused by fire damp or methane gas. However, Sir Humphrey Davy received a £2,000 prize for his very similar lamp, while Stevenson was accused of stealing the idea. It was claimed that such an uneducated man could not have produced such a clever device, this was the first of many such snubs. Stevenson, after being mocked by MPs in Westminster for his Geordie accent, was determined that his son would not suffer similar class prejudice. He sent young Robert to a private school. Meanwhile, a local committee of inquiry exonerated George and awarded him a thousand pounds. But Sir Humphrey Davy went to his grave believing that Stevenson had stolen his invention. In 1802, the Cornishman, Richard Trevithick, produced the first working steam locomotive. George Stevenson produced his first loco in 1814 and named it the Blücher, after the Prussian field marshal, much admired for his battles against Napoleon. Blücher was in fact based on Matthew Murray's locomotive Willington, which worked at Cox Lodge Colliery. So it's clear that George didn't invent the steam locomotive, but what he did do 
was almost as important. Previously, pithead railways had been made from wood, but the heavy steam loco soon destroyed them. George developed iron rails. In 1820, he built the eight-mile Hetton Colliery Railway. This was partly gravity-driven. Full wagons going down pulled the empty ones going up. But locomotives pulled wagons on level stretches, making this the first steam railway of any kind in the world. The rails were four feet, eight and a half inches apart, and this became known as the Stevenson Gauge. It's still in use by most railways in the world today. In 1821, Parliament passed a bill allowing the construction of the Stockton-Darlington Railway. The rest, as they say, is history. Young Robert Stevenson became director of the company set up in Newcastle to build the new locomotives. Soon, he was in charge of all the business dealings. Most importantly, Robert could speak to the politicians in their own language with their own accent. The railway boom that followed was one of the most remarkable changes to any nation in history. The Duke of Wellington, then leader of the Tory party, was appalled at the invention of a machine that would allow the working classes to move around the country at high speed, possibly to cause unrest. The businessmen thought otherwise, and the nation and then the entire world went railway mad. Americans came to Newcastle to learn how to build railroads, as they insist on calling them. Finally, all that hard work, all those long nights of study, had paid off. George Stevenson bought a country estate in Leicestershire and found time to marry again. Twice. Robert, meanwhile, became the leading British engineer of his day. The only serious rival to the legendary Isambard Kingdom Brunel. Between them, the Stevensons changed the world. Let's end with some food and drink. The North East did, of course, invent the Stotty, but it was never patented. However, there are a couple of innovations that everyone's heard of. The first is something many of us remember from childhood illnesses, when Mam would go out and get us a bottle of something fizzy, wrapped in distinctive orange cellophane. Yes, it's Lucozade. It was originally called Glucozade. In 1927, a Newcastle pharmacist, William Walker Hunter, was worried about his daughter, who was recovering slowly from jaundice. He offered her a carbonated drink consisting of glucose and water with a bit of orange flavouring. It seemed to work, so Hunter offered it to his customers, and soon it was a big hit. For the next 11 years, Hunter kept the formula secret. Then, in 1938, he sold out to Beecham's, who renamed the drink Lucozade. Since then, the fizzy pick-me-up has been transformed into a major brand. Today, there are a bewildering number of flavours on offer. Lucozade Original, Lucozade Orange, Lucozade Pink Lemonade, Lucozade Caribbean Crush, Lucozade The Brazilian, Lucozade Wild Cherry, Lucozade Apple Blast, Lucozade Pineapple Punch, Lucozade Watermelon and Strawberry Cooler, Lucozade Citrus Chill. Let's round things off with tea and scones and a little anecdote. In late Victorian times, a man called Thomas Bell was doing a roaring trade with his amazing invention, self-raising flour. Like a lot of businessmen at the time, Bell used the term royal to proclaim the classiness of his product. Bell's Royal. However, when Edward VII came to the throne in 1901, he took exception to this, and it was made illegal to use the word royal without the express permission of the crown. Thomas Bell had to think of a new name for his product. He simply shortened the name, from Bell's Royal to Biro. The rest, as they say, is history. <laughs>